I want to welcome you to our online worship gathering. Here at GOCC, we're a church focused on growing people to be leaders in their families and communities, spreading the love of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Feel free to like, comment, or share today's worship gathering. I also invite you to visit us in person on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. at Ombo Middle School in Atascacita, Texas. Check us out on all of our social media platforms and visit our website at globaloutreachcc.org. Lastly, we want you to know that your life matters because you matter to Christ. Global family, I'm so excited that you are joining us today. We know that today's message will be a blessing to your life if you apply it. Here at Global Outreach Community Church, we understand that we are to obey God's word by applying God's word to our daily life. So we want to continue in our series entitled Stormology 101. Several weeks ago, we started this series entitled Stormology 101. And we started by looking at Mark chapter six, Mark chapter six, Jesus walking on water. And we learned from that particular message lessons from the storm. And then we backtracked and looked at Mark chapter four. We learned from that particular message lessons in the storm, from the storm, in the storm. Well, today, I want you to join me in Matthew chapter 14 as we walk through this message and look at Jesus walking on water to Peter. And today, we want to look at the supporting cast. We know that Jesus is the main character in this narrative, but today, we want to look at Peter and the fellas, the boys in the boat, we want to look at them, and the subject for today's message is lessons from the supporting cast. In every movie, there's a leading actor, a main actor, and then there are the supporting cast. And I like to share with people, don't judge me, Global, don't judge me, but one of my favorite movies is Training Day. And I love the character of Denzel Washington because Denzel gets out of himself and he is playing a character that is different for Denzel Washington. But then you have Ethan Hawkins, who is in the supporting role, and both Denzel as the main character and Ethan as the supporting character were up for many awards. Well, in this story, Jesus is the main character, and none of us can be Jesus. But I guarantee you that all of us are either Peter or we are the boys in the boat, the other disciples. So if you would, wherever you are, in your office, your car, would you join me in Matthew chapter 14? In Matthew chapter 14, we see this narrative of Jesus walking on water. And this particular narrative, this particular story, follows the beheading of John. And after the beheading of John, we see that Jesus and his disciples, Jesus breaks bread. He multiplies two fish, five loaves of bread, and he feeds 5,000 men, not counting women and children. But historians believe that he fed upward of 20,000 people with two fish, five loaves of bread. And if you read Luke gospel, you will find out that he had 12 baskets left over. Where in Matthew chapter 14, this narrative of Jesus walking on water follows this supernatural miracle of Jesus multiplying two fish, five loaves of bread. And I would love to say it like this. I like to say it like this. This particular miracle of Jesus walking on water follows the miracle of Jesus feeding the multitude, two fish, five loaves of bread. So here are the disciples. They are on a spiritual high. And after being on this spiritual high, Jesus commands the boys, the disciples, his posse, his 12 men to get in the boat so that they may go to the other side. And one of the reasons that Jesus wants them to get into the boat is because they did not understand the miracle of the two fish and the five loaves. So it's testing time. How many times in our life do we fail to understand miracles that Jesus has performed in our life. So in Matthew chapter 14, 
We pick up in verse 22 of Matthew's gospel. And Matthew records these words. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening had come, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the winds, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. And watch this. I love Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith. I love this. Jesus didn't say he had no faith, but little faith. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. I love that, that Peter dared to be different. I don't know about you, but storms have a way of hitting my life at unexpected times. And if I'm honest with you today, I would love to dictate the type of storms that God allows to come into my life. But I realize as a follower of Jesus Christ, there are two types of storms that enter our lives. There are storms of perfection where God wants to perfect our faith. He wants to mature our faith. He wants to deepen our faith. He wants to draw us closer to him. So he allows storms to come to perfect our faith. But then there are storms of correction, storms of discipline. You will see that in the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter one, two and three, that God allowed a storm to hit the boat or the ship that Jonah was on simply because Jonah was disobedient. And there are times in our lives that God will send storms, allow storms, permit storms to enter our lives to discipline us, to remind us that he cares, that we are his children. And as a loving father, there are times that a loving father will discipline his children, not to break them, but to bless them, not to make them bitter, but to make them better, to make them holy, to draw them closer to himself through the form of discipline. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are all types of storms that enter our lives. There are marital storms that there are times in your marriage that you are going through storms. Can I make you laugh? There are times when I don't even want to look at Cheryl Francine Anderson. We don't want to talk, but there are storms because we have a relationship that we love each other. And we are two broken people serving a holy God. And because we're sinful in nature and we are broken people, sometimes we just experience storms in our relationship. There are financial storms. I don't know about you, but sometimes it seems as if there is more month than money, more bills than what you have in your pocket to pay the bills. And you just experience these financial storms. What about those who are parents? You experience this parental storm that you raise your son, your daughter to the best of your ability, according to uh, godly principles. And all of a sudden, little John, little Ray Ray, little Pookie, they get old and all the stuff that you put in them. You can't even find it in them because the voice of the world, the voice of the culture, the voice of the environment has become stronger than your voice. I call those storms. 
So today, what can we learn from the life of Peter that we can apply to our lives as it relates to storms? You're asking good questions, and I believe God has some holy hints, some holy suggestions from the biblical text that if we take and apply to our lives, it would make us better when the storms of life hit our lives. So here's the first thing that I believe that Peter teaches us in this particular narrative. The first thing that Peter teaches us is that when storms enter our lives, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. Can I repeat that again? That you are to walk by faith and not by sight. Can you join me in the biblical story? It is Peter who gets out of the boat. But what happens before Peter gets out of the boat? Jesus, again, if you look at context, he performs the miracle of multiplying two fish, five loaves of bread. He feeds upward of 20,000 people, and the people wanted to make him king. He realizes this. But then Jesus wanted to spend some time alone with the Father. So he tells his disciples to get in a boat to go to the other side. Don't miss this. If you read it too quick, you will miss some holy nuggets. Jesus gave them a promise that you will get to the other side. I don't care what happens when you get in this boat as you're crossing to the other side. I gave you a word with a promise that when you get into the boat, we will go to the other side. So the disciples get in the boat at the evening time. And here's Jesus. He's up in the mountain. He's praying have an intimacy with the Father. And I believe through my spiritual holy imagination that as he is in intimacy with his Father, his eyes are still on the disciples. And the text says that the disciples get into the boat. They get far enough in the middle of the sea, maybe not geographically, but they had traveled too far to turn around. And yet they had a distance to go. And all of a sudden, a storm appears out of nowhere. And this storm appears out of nowhere. And Jesus comes out of the mountain and he's walking on the water to his disciples. And the disciples are afraid because they thought it was a ghost. And Jesus speaks to his disciples according to the text. And he says, listen, take courage. It is I do not be afraid. Oh, that's some good nuggets right there. We're coming back to that simple phrase. Jesus says, wait a minute. Be of good courage. It is I do not be afraid. And I love what Peter did. Peter was the only disciple to say, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. And I love Peter. Peter got out of the boat. In the middle of a storm, the boat was filling up with water. The waves were crashing against the boat. And I can almost guarantee you that the disciples were terrified. And yet one out of the 12 had enough faith to say, God, if it is you, bid me to come. And Jesus gave him one word, come. And Peter got out of the boat out of his comfort zone. He got away from his disciples and he walked on water by faith. As long as he walked in faith and kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to walk on water. The Bible doesn't tell us how far he walked. The Bible doesn't tell us how long he walked, but I do know he walked. You know how I know he walked? Because the Bible said it. And if the Bible said it, I believe it. And he walked to Jesus. But what caught my attention was not just Peter walking to Jesus, not just Peter walking on water, not just Jesus walking on water. Can I interject right here? Jesus is the only person that I know will walk on top of stuff that we sink in. Oh, I feel like preaching today. He is the only one in human history that will walk over stuff that we seek in. And that's why we need Jesus in our life. But at least I hold you too long right there. Peter gets out of the boat. He walks to Jesus at Jesus' word, and he walks by faith. But I had to wrestle with this text because I asked myself the question, why was it that none of the other disciples got out of the boat? 
I mean, I searched and I searched. Why was it that the disciples stayed in the boat? I think I got the answer. The answer is this. Peter was the only one to have enough boldness and faith to speak to Jesus in life's storms. That Peter was the only one to speak to Jesus and Jesus spoke back to him. There's no record of the other disciples speaking. So Peter moved by faith at the word of God. But I'm still wrestling with these disciples. Uh, when I look at these disciples, I started asking myself, I wonder if these disciples engaged in what I call boat talk. Can I tell you what boat talk is? Boat talk is this, that when Peter got out of the boat to walk on water, I wonder if James said, now look at Peter, he's always showing off. That's boat talk right there. That when you're trying to do something extraordinary, somebody always has something to say, and I call that boat talk. What about John? Could it be that John said, look at Peter. He think he is like Jesus, so he's walking on water. No, Peter understood he wasn't Jesus, but what he understood was that at the word of God, he moved according to God's word. Can I encourage you with a word from God this morning? Sometimes when storms hit your life, you just have to move at God's word. That if God has already given you biblical promises, and maybe he's whispered in your spirit softly at night, that this this too shall pass, you move at the word of God. So Peter teaches us how to walk by faith and not by sight. I love Peter's boldness. I love Peter that he had the gumption to get out the boat. But here is the problem that Peter ran into. Here's the second thing that we can learn from Peter. Peter ran into the problem, as the text said, of seeing the wind. I don't know about you, but I've never seen the wind in my life. I felt the effects of the wind, but I've never seen the wind. So I had to ask myself this question. And here's the question I want you to ask yourself when the storms of life are entering your atmosphere, your home, your life, your environment. Here's the question you need to ask yourself. Will you believe your personal situation or God's revelation? Will you look at what's happening in front of you or will you trust God's word? Watch the text. Verse 27 of chapter 14. Peter says, okay, God, verse 28, if it's you, bid me to come. But don't skip verse 27. Here's the key in the text. Jesus said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Here's the backdrop. That phrase is also found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses was talking to God through a burning bush. And the bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. And here is Moses on the backside of the desert talking to God. And God is telling Moses, go back to Egypt and you tell Pharaoh to let my people go and Moses says God who shall I tell him sent me and God said you tell him I am that I am sent you in other words you tell Pharaoh that the self existed one is sending you this is the same phrase in verse 27 that Jesus walks on water it seems like a ghost he tells the disciples I am God revealed in the flesh. And there are times that God allows our storms to come into our lives that he can reveal a, a greater degree of himself to you. And that's why you got to learn not to complain during your storms. That's why you have to be careful about bickering during your storms. You celebrate Jesus because could it be that he's trying to reveal who he really is in the storms? May I remind you that the disciples missed who Jesus was. They missed who Jesus was when he multiplied the two fish, the five loaves of bread. But if we look at this same story in Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, and we back up to chapter 1, we can see Jesus day by day revealing 
who he was to the disciples. It was Jesus that was teaching in the synagogue. It was Jesus that went to the house of Peter mother-in-law and he healed Peter mother-in-law of a fever. And the text said at night, at evening time, all the people in the town that were sick, they showed up at Peter's mother-in-law's house and Jesus Heal those of various diseases. He constrained demons. He forced the demonic forces out. And then, verse 35 of chapter 1 of Mark, Jesus takes time to go to a solitary place to pray. The disciples are looking for him. They find him. And then Jesus gets up from his time of prayer and re-engages in ministry. He heals a man who had a withered hand. He healed a man who had leprosy. And all those miracles of healing the sick, of forcing out demons, of multiplying food, and even in Mark chapter 4, Jesus calms the storms, the disciples missed who he was. So Jesus said, listen, I'm going to do this again. I'm going to hit rewind, plus pray, and show you who I am. I am God revealed in the flesh. And thank God that he reveals himself in our storms. But here's the third thing we can learn from Peter. Here's the third thing. Write this down. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the third thing that we can learn about my man Peter. That Peter teaches us that we can have major moments of faith and major moments of fear. We can have both a spiritual high and believe in God for the impossible but then the wind and the storm, the waves that are crashing against our boat will literally cause us to have fear. Can I show it to you in the text? Watch this. Verse 30. But seeing the wind, he, Peter, became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Did you see it? Peter had enough faith to get out the boat to walk on water. Peter had enough faith to get out of the boat, to leave the boys, the fellas, the disciples behind, to walk a certain mileage or distance on the water. And even though he exercised faith in the middle of the storm, all of a sudden, when the effects of the storm hit Peter, he had major moment of fear. Hey, I know sometimes we think we are spiritual giants. We are these pseudo saints. But there are times, if you're honest, you have major moments of faith, but you also have major moments of fear. That you have moments where you're believing God for the impossible and you're not sure how and when God is going to show up. So now your fear surfaces. I've been there. I've been there. I remember one time I was believing God to send a major check for a project I was doing with my job and we were bumping up against the deadline and I found myself on the floor battling faith, but also battling my fear. And I said, God, if you don't show up, I'm going to be embarrassed because I told the people I serve an on time God. I told the people we were going on a trip to the Dominican Republic and we were six thousand dollars short. And God took me back to Matthew chapter six. Do not worry that if I can take care of the birds of the air and I can clothe the lilies of the valley, surely you are much more than them. And when God reminded me not to worry, but to trust him, I got up and guys, listen to me. About 30 minutes later, I got a call that I was not anticipating from a guy who would never give to a parachurch ministry, who would never give to international ministry. And he said, hey, I'm going to write the check for $6,000. Hey, I don't know about, I'm excited this morning. I'm preaching to myself because I'm expecting God to do some stuff right now. I'm believing God for some major miracles, some major moments, some pivotal things in my life that would change the trajectory of what I'm doing. So Peter teaches us that we can have major moments of faith and major moments of fear. But here's the fourth thing we can learn from this text. Here's the fourth thing. That God would get us out of major moments of faith, major moments of fear, and major moments of failure because God is consistent. Did you hear me today? 
not because of your consistency, but because God is consistent. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus is consistent. He is who he is. And what I love about Jesus, he was the same God man before the storm. He was the same God man during the storm. He was the same God man that walked on the water, but he was the same God man that walked Peter back to the boat. And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. That shows me that although I have major moments of faith, major moments of fear, major moments of failure, God will always be consistent. And that's why I place my faith in this consistent God because he has never failed me. So the question you need to ask yourself today is that are you willing to leave what looks like security for biblical security? Are you willing to leave the crew, your group behind, your posse, the people you run with, the people you may have a relationship with at church to follow Jesus in the middle of the storm? Peter let doubt displace his faith, but God is consistent. So here's the last thing I want to press into you here today. Here's the last thing. That storms have the potential to bless us, but also bless others. Oh, don't you miss that. That's rich. That although God permits storms in your life, and maybe you're going through a storm right now, and maybe you're asking God, God, how long will you allow this storm to be in my life. Because you do know storms could be three months, six months, or a year. But God may want to use this storm to bless you and to bless others. Let me show it to you in the text, and I'm done. Watch this. So verse 30, Peter sees the wind. He becomes frightened. He starts to sink. He cries out, Lord, save me. A quick prayer. Three words, Lord, save me. I don't even want to get stuck there because that's a whole sermon by itself of how Peter prayed. And then the text continues. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand. He took hold of him. He said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And watch what the disciples said. Verse 33 Matthew 14, 33. And those who were in the boat worshiped him. And they said, surely you are God's son. Let's unpack that as we close. Peter was the one that got out of the boat. Peter was the one who walked on water. Peter was the one who saw the effects of the wind. Peter was the one that started sinking. Peter was the one that prayed to Jesus, Lord, save me. Jesus stretched out his hand. He pulls Peter's up, Peter up, and watch this. They both walked back to the boat. Both of them got into the boat. As soon as both of them got into the boat, the text said that the wind stopped, but they worshiped him. Oh, can I repeat that again? Peter was the one to get out the boat. Peter walked on water. Peter saw the effects of the wind. Peter started to sink. Peter prayed, Lord, save me. Jesus reached down, picks up Peter. Both Jesus and Peter walks on water back to the boat. Both Peter and Jesus gets into the boat and the wind stopped. But they worshiped him. Oh, don't you miss it this morning. Perhaps God is allowing your personal storm to come into your life so that you may be blessed But how you handle the storm and how they see God consistency will cause other people to worship him. To worship him. So could it be today your storm is really not about you? Maybe God is trying to correct you. Maybe God is trying to discipline you. Maybe God is trying to deepen your relationship with him. Maybe God is trying to Deepen your faith. But I want you to know Jesus is bigger than your fears. That he is consistent. 
And he's trying to reveal a greater measure of who he is to you. He's God's son. He is the water walker. He is the miracle worker. And just like he walked over on top of water, he can walk over things in your life that perhaps you're sinking in. And Jesus may want to use this opportunity to teach you how to worship him and others see you worshiping him and they start worshiping him as well. Can I close with some encouragement this morning? Trust him. Trust him when your life is calm. But trust him when there are storms. Trust him when you're up, but trust him when you're down. Trust him when things are chaotic and your life is filled with chaos. But also trust him when life is smooth. And when you trust Jesus, he has a way of deepening your faith, building you and maturing you so that you can handle the storms of life. Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you that through your sovereignty, you permit storms. You allow storms to enter our lives. And today we understand that before a situation or problem enters our life, it has to get your permission. And we thank you, God, that you permit these things to happen to grow us in our faith, to deepen our faith, to build our foundation that we may worship you. So, Father, would you bless someone who's going through a storm? And would you remind them that they, too, shall get to the other side? We thank you now in Jesus name. Let us all say amen. Can we just celebrate God right where you are? We just say what I call a personal hand clap for praise that God is so wise. He is so sovereign that he allows these storms to enter our lives because he has a purpose for our life. Again, thank you for joining us today. We want to remind you that your life matters because you matter to Christ. God bless you.